Hey there, I'm Jim Cruz, lead pastor of Atmosphere Church. Thank you for listening to our church podcast. Our desire is to lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more about our church, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. I'm praying today's episode will touch your heart and change your life. The Unshakable Kingdom. Hello, everybody. My name is Pastor Jim. I'm the lead pastor. Hey, find three people around you and knuckle bump and say, I will not be shaken. Just, just knuckle bump them and declare that. We will not be shaken. That's why we're in this series, Unshakable Kingdom. And uh, I, I am so excited that this week is uh, Connect Night week. And um, some of you have never been to a Connect Night. And uh, Andy said it so well at the beginning. Like, we were connected uh, in the Gospels. Uh, we were connected to Jesus to be connected with each other. And, and so find your people. And these Connect Nights we do for our ladies on Monday and our, our men on Thursdays is essential because you need some battle buddies in your life. You were not meant to live your faith life by yourself. And so come, all right? So dudes, uh, I've got like a, a word on Thursday. I'll be here. Uh, and uh, you guys always sign up so late. The ladies always outpace us. The ladies is like, are they're sold out. And I've got like 15 guys. But I guarantee you by Thursday, we'll have like 130 guys. So sign up uh, because you're uh, making Amy and Heidi go crazy because uh, you guys don't RSVP. All right, so sign up. Uh, with that, we are going to go into a lot of scripture today. I'm going to just tell you on the front end of this talk that if you've never downloaded our app, this would be a great Sunday to download it because on the app we have our notes featured. And so we're going to be giving you all kinds of scripture today. And we're, we're going over what some people say is a very complex theological concept, but I hope to simplify it. But in order to simplify it, I have to give you a lot of scripture, a lot of verses. So it'll be helpful not just for you to keep track today, but maybe potentially throughout this week as you review what we've talked about uh, in this series. So we are talking about God's kingdom, the unshakable kingdom. And I, I thought it was just such a, a crazy coincidence, or as I like to call a God incidence, that we came up with this name, Unshakable Kingdom, and the week that we launched our series, we have like three earthquakes. And we had another one this week. Did you guys feel that one? Yeah. So it, it happened. And then there was a sonic boom. My house, I've noticed my house is making a noise as we have an earthquake, and then the house makes a noise, and then the ground shakes. But there was a I guess a rocket launched on Thursday, so it had a sonic boom, and I heard the house shake, and I go, uh-oh, here it comes. Uh, but it, it wasn't an earthquake. It was just sonic boom. But all that to say, we are shaking. The earth is shaking, both figuratively and literally, and I know that video may be a, a little bit over the top for some of you, but this is the world we're living in, and I, and I think uh, it, it is a great picture of what all of us are feeling internally. And we need to talk about it because Scripture says that in the end, everything is going to be shaken except for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is called the unshakable kingdom. So if you have your notes app out, I'm going to give you the first Scripture of the morning. And that's Hebrews 12, verse 28. It says, therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So the shaking that's happening, it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to show us, as in Hebrews 11, that the only sure thing that we could put our faith in that is not going to be shaken is the kingdom of God. I told you guys last week, wealth is a good thing, but it makes for a bad king. Uh, achievements are a good thing, but achievements by themselves make for bad kings in our life. Those things aren't supposed to lead our life. And a kingdom by definition, the working definition, and I'll put it up on the screen, is the kingdom of God is any space where God rules and reigns as king. And here's what you probably need to understand in this series is that something or someone is ruling and reigning in your life. And it could be you. You could be ruling and reigning, calling the shots for how your life goes, or maybe there's some other things that are kind of leading you. 
But the call of God in the series is to come to a place where we really authentically have God as king of our life, that he is ruling and reigning over our life. So with that, I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into this message that I'm simply entitling Kingdom Invasion. All right, I thought about kingdom invaders, and then I just went to space invaders, all right? So I'm an 80s child, so, I mean, Atari, you know, was it Atari 2600? Come on, where are my Atari people? Like the original game uh, console. So, okay, let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for this amazing group of people that you put together, God. We're family. And God, we are the most beautiful blended family on the planet. And I'm so grateful for every person that, Lord, you divinely led here, God. Nobody's here by coincidence. They're here by providence. You drew them in here. God, you have a word for them. My prayer, God, is that, Lord, you would give us the ears to hear and the hearts to receive everything that you want to deposit into our lives. That we have an authentic, powerful encounter with you as our living God. And we thank you for that in advance. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. So... Let's talk about the kingdom of God for a minute because as we step into this whole talk, and last week it was shake it up, but this week with this kingdom invasion, I, I think it needs to be talked through about what is the kingdom of God because as a lot of us process this idea and we have this working definition, a lot of people have a misconception or a misunderstanding that the kingdom of God Or the kingdom of heaven. It's mentioned about a hundred times in the New Testament, 60 times alone by Jesus himself. But a lot of people have this misconception or misunderstanding that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is is like something that happens just when we die. Like we die and we go to the kingdom of heaven and then we enter in through the pearly gates. And somehow in history, somebody made up this thing that St. Peter somehow is going to be the concierge of heaven. So we got to go through St. Peter to get into the pearly gates. And I don't know where that came from. If you have the origin story of where that that came from, that would be uh, insightful for me. But we have this conception that, oh, the kingdom of heaven is what happens to us when we die. And there's a lot of misunderstandings with what the kingdom of God is. And I think some of that is because of the language that's specifically used in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a wild book. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, John who wrote the, the book of Revelation was on some kind of an acid trip. And there's a lot of symbolism and there's a lot of pictures of creatures with eyes all over their bodies. And But I, I think there is some truth in revelation that we need to unpack when it comes to this talk about the kingdom of God. And it's going to bring you understanding and some clarity uh, about this whole entire series. So this becomes an important thing for you to learn, especially if you're not real familiar with the Bible. And by the way, we have a daily Bible reading plan and there's some cards out there. We have new cards coming for October for the next three months, but we want you to have a practice of daily reading scripture. And so we have an Old Testament chapter and a New Testament chapter in uh, the calendar. Matter of fact, it's on the app. You can access it there. So I apologize ahead of time. We didn't, like, this isn't, like, something that we plan. It just kind of happens that we're going chapter by chapter. And so when we get to the end of the Old Testament, we start at the beginning. When we get to the end of the New Testament, we start at the beginning. And it just so happens that this next month here, we are in the book of Job and the book of Revelation at the same time. <laughs> it's, uh, I was like, I apologize about that, but I, I will tell you that when you are praying, you can even get something out of Job and Revelation. And I think today you're going to get something out of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 11, it says the seventh angel. So this is a, a future event. And so Revelation is is how things are going to be revealed in the end. It says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So what Revelation is letting us in on, there is coming a moment in the future where King Jesus is going to establish his throne on the earth. He's going to rule and reign on the earth, but it hasn't happened yet. 
And so in Revelation chapter 19, we we have this picture of how it's going to happen. And in Revelation 19, the picture is this white horse coming from heaven, coming to this earth, and Jesus is riding on the horse, and it says, and on his robe, and on his thigh, he has his name written, this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the title of Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming with a tattoo on his thigh. Now, that might be reading too much into it, all right? So somebody's like, our our tattoos like okay to get I'm like well Jesus is rocking one in Revelation 19 on his thigh that might be a loose interpret interpretation of that uh but you know just pray over it if you know, if you're convicted not to get one don't get one if you really want one you pray about it then then get one all right uh I don't think it's going to keep you out of heaven to get some ink on your arm all right but Jesus is going to have a title whether it's on his robe, on his thigh, it's, it's, it's going to be very clear that he's coming to establish his throne on the earth. That's going to happen. It, it's coming in the future. And we hear a lot of talk about is, is the end near? Is Jesus coming back soon? And I believe he is. I believe, I'm convinced that in our lifetime, we're going to see the return of Jesus. I think all the evidence is in all of the craziness that is happening right now. And I don't have time to get into biblical prophecy. But there is a lot of stuff going down that is in alignment with what these ancient, ancient manuscripts have told us for thousands of years. It's happening today. Matthew 25, verse 31. Jesus himself is commenting on this future event. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and the, all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. So in the second coming of Christ, he is establishing his throne on earth. In the first coming of Christ, he was introduced as the suffering servant. The second coming of Christ, he's going to be the conquering king. And when he comes as a conquering king, there's going to be judgment. And the people that belong to him are going to be welcomed into his kingdom. The people that don't belong to him are going to face eternal judgment. The Bible talks about it. I know it gets everybody a little uncomfortable that the Bible speaks about judgment, but the reason the Bible speaks about judgment is that God wants you on his team. God wants you on his family. He doesn't want you to miss out on this. He wants you to belong to his kingdom. And the call in this series is to consider the kingdom of God seriously for your life because it is the best way to live your life, and it has a benefit package that takes you into heaven. Come on, somebody. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And then it says, in the future, talking about in future tense in Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the Old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's God's specialty. He makes things new. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, he makes all things new. Just tell, just tell them that. Declare that to your neighbor. He makes all things new. And there's coming a future date where every tear will be wiped away from people's eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no cancer diagnoses. There will be no more tragedies because the king is going to have his throne. That's what's happening in the future. Now, we're living in this tension because we're living in the place between the inauguration and the consummation. You have the inauguration of the kingdom of God, and then you have the consummation of the coming and the establishment as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we're living in this between space. But let, let's first talk about the inauguration. Because this is so important for us to understand. So the word inauguration for a lot of us, like we immediately think of Capitol Hill. We think of Washington, D.C. We, we have this drill we do every four years where we inaugurate a president and then they you know, become the ruler. They become the uh, commander in chief over our nation. 
So every four years, the inauguration happens. And, and then after the inauguration takes place, then there's the inauguration speech that every president makes uh, uh, you know, right after they are sworn in to the office and they take the helm as the president. And as we think about this, I think it's so fascinating that when Jesus came in his first advent, when he came the first time as the suffering servant, there, there was a little bit of an inauguration that, that took place with Jesus bringing the kingdom. That he came, he was appointed and anointed by God to be the leader and to be the king that he is. And you see it in the baptism of Jesus. Now, let me give you a little history lesson. So the Roman Empire which at the time was ruling and reigning over this area of Israel, they had this kind of way about knowing who was supposed to be the anointed or appointed leader. They had these people called augurs. They were officiants. That, it sounds really weird, but, but they tracked the flights of birds and the patterns of birds in order to know that a person was supposed to be a leader that was supposed to be the appointed or anointed person to lead. Matter of fact, the emperor at the time of Jesus's birth was Caesar Augustus. And Caesar Augustus was given the name Augustus after this augur, after these augurs were were showing these signs of the birds that he was supposed to be the emperor over Rome. His name was Octavian, and before that was Octavius, but he was the general in, in the Roman army, and he built up, and, and then this message from the birds came, and they said, no, he is our emperor. He is Caesar Augustus. So that's kind of the origin of the name inauguration. It comes from these augurs from the Roman Empire that had these signs and these omens that were shown through birds. Interesting, because in the baptism of Jesus, I never saw this before. So fascinating, the layers that the Bible has to it. As almost like a heavenly nod to the way the Romans would deem somebody appointed and anointed, check out what happens at Jesus' baptism. So you can read about this in Mark 1. You can also read about this in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. But in Mark 1 chapter 9, it says, At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a, like a dove, a bird. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. So the dove, for us that are believers and followers of Jesus, we know the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But for the Roman Empire, this was a way that they could see a new king had arrived and is now being sworn into office because of the bird. Isn't that crazy? So now the dove is descended on Jesus. Something was activated because Jesus' ministry didn't start until after he was baptized in water. So this wasn't just about identity. This was about inauguration. The kingdom of God had arrived, and the king was now in place. That's what this is all about. So what happens after the inauguration? The inauguration speech. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. Because Jesus goes through the wilderness, has his own temptations with the devil, comes out of the temptation, and ends up in his hometown, Nazareth. And this is where we basically hear him preach for the first time. In Luke 4, he says, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went in, into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. So he looked for this spot. He found the place where it was written. And by the way, in our Bibles, it's found in Isaiah chapter 61. And he reads the scroll. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. By the way, in the Hebrew language, another word for anointed one is Messiah. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This was an ancient prophetic word given to the prophet Isaiah that was now on these scrolls. 
Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This was his inauguration speech. He was in power now. He was saying, these are the things that you're going to see happen because the kingdom of God has arrived. And I'm here as the king to do kingdom business. And I'm here to tell you that I'm in complete alignment that God is ruling and reigning in my life. And so you're going to start seeing the kingdom of God move in this world. Matthew chapter 12. There was some conflict and some controversy going on because Jesus had set a guy free of some demons. And there was talk with the religious professionals and they were like, hey, uh, like he's delivering people of demons because he's a demon. And Jesus is like, that makes no logical sense. <laughs> like a demon wouldn't deliver other demons. Uh, that would be a house divided. And then he goes on to say this. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he's telling them, like, do the math. You know the prophecies. You know the works of the Messiah. So if demons are really being cast out of people by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God isn't somewhere in the future. The kingdom of God is right now. Luke chapter 17. I told you I was going to give you a lot of verses. Luke 17. So there's Pharisees, these religious professionals. They were trying to figure out Jesus. And it says, uh, once I'm being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. They probably wanted to kill him in that moment because he was pretty much saying that the king has arrived. I'm the anointed one and the appointed one. Didn't you guys see it in the bird? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here and I'm ready to do my father's business. Now, Jesus is inaugurated, he's put into power, and now he's doing the work of the kingdom of God. And he's telling everybody the kingdom of God is now. It's not someday, it's now. Which I want to introduce you to a theological expression called the already but not yet. And it's, and it's important for you to know this. That the kingdom of God is coming, but the kingdom of God at the same time is already here. So when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God. When he resurrected, he gave us his spirit so that the kingdom of God can also be in us. So the kingdom of God is now, but the kingdom of God is also coming in a future event where where all things are going to be made right. So right now, we're not experiencing the kingdom of God in all of its fullness. But we're seeing glimpses of the kingdom of God right now. And we're living in this tension. That when Jesus came, he, he brought good news to the poor. He brought freedom to the captives and to the oppressed. He brought healing to the sick. He, he brought, you know, uh, recovery of the sight to the blind. Like all these miracles were happening. And I'm telling you, those miracles are still happening today. That God has empowered his church by his spirit so that the same things that were happening through Jesus are happening through his citizens That because we carry the Spirit of God, the same miracles that happen in the Bible are still happening today. But we live in this tension that there's healing, but not everybody's healed. There's recovery, but not everybody is in full recovery. That that, There's good news to the poor, but there are still poor. And so we live in this tension because we, we see glimpses of the kingdom, ways that the kingdom is manifesting in our midst, but it's not being fully revealed. We're still crying. We still have to go to funerals. People are still being diagnosed with sicknesses. And occasionally we will see a miracle happen and a tumor will be completely eradicated from somebody's body that has a tumor. We had somebody with with brain cancer, we had tumors that went to the doctor, got scanned, the tumors were there, we prayed over them, they went back, got a new scan, and the tumors were completely gone. 
Supernaturally, they were gone. Miracles still happen. My own brother, I told you guys this story before, but we were at a, a, a conference and the, the person speaking, he says, hey, I want you guys, to, if, if somebody has a need around you, I want you to lay hands and pray over them. And my brother at the time had a knee, a bad knee, because he was uh, a referee for football and he just messed his knee up. I think he had a torn ACL or something. He, like, he literally fell as he walked into this conference center. And in that moment I said, bro, I'm supposed to pray for you. This guy's saying that we need to pray for the people that need something in their life, and you, you, like, need a brand new knee, bro. So I laid my hand on his knee, and I believe that God heals, but I've never experienced this in all the prayer times that I've had with people where I prayed. I, I had my hand on his knee, and his knee began supernaturally moving under my hand. There was some snap, crackle, and pops happening. And, and as that was happening, I looked at my brother because I was like, what is, like, I've never experienced this before. My brother was weeping. And then so I just kept praying, and the, the, the knee kept, kept moving, and then pretty soon I said amen, and I said, did you feel that? He goes, yes, I felt that. He immediately, like, jumped up on his feet because he was, like, sitting, and he jumped up, and he started jumping. He's like, oh, my goodness. Oh my. I go, stop that, man. I go, I don't want your knee to go out. He goes, it's, it's better. He went back to the doctor. He was supposed to have surgery that week. Never needed surgery. He got a brand new knee in that moment. <laughs> Look at your neighbor say, it still happens. But we're living in this tension. It doesn't always happen. You know, here, here's a reality that, that doesn't get preached a lot, that Jesus didn't heal everybody. He healed some people, and there's story after story in the Gospels. But he also, he healed a man that was waiting at the pool of Bethesda, but other people that were still sick, they were still sick. The Apostle Paul, he has texts where not everybody was healed by the Apostle Paul. There was still sickness left behind in these powerful ministries because healing doesn't always happen because we are living in the already but not yet. There will come a day, there will be no more cancer. There will be no more death. There will be no mourning. There will be no more crying. Every tear will be dried from our eyes because the king will come and make all injustice right again. So we live in this place where we're like, well, then what do we do about this? I read a book years ago, and it changed my life. And maybe somebody here, this is just for you to go home and read a great book. But it was written by a guy that has went to be with Jesus now for decades. His name was C.S. Lewis. A lot of you are familiar with his work because of the Chronicles of Narnia. Disney made some great movies from his books. But I believe the best book he ever wrote, personally, is Mere Christianity. And he wrote a book, and he said, I want to write a book explaining God and explaining Jesus without ever using one Bible verse. Because if you have a friend that's a skeptic, the last thing your friend wants to hear who's a skeptic about God and the belief in God is a bunch of scriptures that they don't believe in. So C.S. Lewis, as a philosopher and as a, a college professor, he said, I want to write a book that explains the idea of God and the concept of God and, and the reality of Jesus in a way that doesn't even have to use one Bible verse. And he wrote Mere Christianity. And uh, a fun fact for you is Russell Brand, who is a British actor who recently converted to Christianity and is on fire for God. If you guys are on Instagram, this guy is posting like almost daily of his experiences that he's having with Jesus now. And you know who the main influence was in CS, or, or him becoming uh, a follower of Jesus is C.S. Lewis. He read the works. I believe he read Mere Christianity and it changed his life because God is real. And Jesus is the king. And check out what C.S. Lewis writes in his famous book, Mere Christianity. It's one of my favorite quotes from this book. Enemy occupied territory. That is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. We are living behind enemy lines. And you don't need a pastor to tell you that the days are evil. And, and the, the days are dark. And it seems like things are getting more evil and more dark every day. And we just read in our Bible reading plan this week in 1 John that the ruler of this world is not yet Jesus. The ruler of this world that is still in power is the devil. 
and his evil and his darkness is pretty much getting to run the show. But what Jesus does is he gets in behind enemy lines to sabotage the work of darkness by bringing light, sabotage the work of darkness by bringing love, sabotaging the work uh, work of darkness by bringing life. And we are being called as kingdom people to take part in the great campaign of sabotage, to give the devil a big middle finger in Jesus' name. (laughs) Can I say that as a pastor? (laughs) But check this out, 1 Peter chapter 2. Somebody's like, what church am I at right now? (laughs) Well, I was pastoring Vegas before you guys, so. (laughs) But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood. Think about that. You're a royal priesthood. You know what a priest is? A priest is somebody who puts God on display for the rest of the people. So Peter is saying to us, the church, that you're a chosen people. You've been chosen by God. You're a royal priesthood. You are putting God on display for the rest of the world. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I I want us to just be in this this place of, of knowing that we're in attention. We're called to the kingdom of light, but we have to still live in the kingdom of darkness. Do you feel that tension? But now we are to be the light bearers. Now we are supposed to bring the kingdom of God and sabotage the kingdom of darkness that we all have to live in. And we do that with our own lives. So I put it this way, how to be part of the kingdom sabotage campaign. And some of you are like, yes, this is my church. You're just a rebel. But you're a rebel with the cause. You're not a rebel without a cause. You're like, yes, like that speaks my language. Like we're, we're supposed to be these kingdom people that are taking ground for God and anticipation for him taking his rightful place at the throne. So here's what we do. We, we're going we're gonna to learn how to be part of this, this sabotage campaign. Number one, it starts with making God king of your own life. You become part of the sabotage campaign by you making God king of your life. And it's easy to say, but it's a little bit more difficult to do. Because I talked last week, I said, all of us love the concept of Jesus being our savior, but we kind of get uncomfortable with making Jesus our king. Because Jesus being our savior means that we're forgiven, but Jesus as our king makes us responsible for the life that we're living that we no longer get to do whatever we want to do, that we're coming under the rule and reign of Jesus who has told us specifically how to live our lives. And we're going to spend probably a couple weeks talking about kingdom values because I think in our new generation of followers of Jesus, I think a lot of us have kind of maybe walked away and, and maybe don't even understand that the kingdom of God has its own set of values that we are to abide by as kingdom people. That we don't get to live however we want to live. But we have a not just a good king. He's a great king. And, and the rules or regulations or, or decrees that he's given us is, is actually for our benefit. So that we can thrive in life. And I will tell you, not just as a pastor, but as a person, living the Jesus way is the best kind of way to live. There's no better way to live. I mean, you could follow and do everything the world is doing. And good luck to that. Because in the end, it just seems like living a life apart from God, everything eventually self-implodes. But the kingdom of God and living God's way just seems to keep you put together. And you come out on the other side in a whole different way. You know, I, I'm convinced, like, you know, in the Old Testament, God called the, the people of Israel. He said, I want you to be my people And he didn't do this because, like, Israel was more special than the rest of the world. He says, no, I just need, I need a group of people 
that I can use it as, as an example. If you guys follow my ways and follow my decrees and follow my commands, if you guys as a group of people do it in such a way, <laughs> your life is going to be so attractive that all the other nations in the world are going to want to be just like you. They're going to want to make me God of their nation. And we as a church, we're the chosen people, meaning that God wants to, to use your life to put you on display to the rest of the world of like when everything's falling apart, they're not. When everything is being shaken, they're not. Man, what what is your secret sauce? And you simply say, I've made Jesus king of my life. I'm not living life according to my way. I'm living my life according to King Jesus' way. And you know what? It is the better way to live. That's what it is, you guys. Maybe that's not a popular message to preach, but I want you to really experience the benefits of being a kingdom of God person. And in order to be a part of the kingdom of God, you got to make Jesus the king of your life. Jesus isn't meant to be pocket Jesus. He's meant to be king size Jesus. I wish I would have brought my pocket Jesus today. I forgot him at home. Some of you that are are, are, uh, atmosphere uh, OGs, you know pocket Jesus, all right? I'll bring him back next week just for the fun of it. But number two is stay filled with the spirit of God. So make Jesus king in your life, in your own life, but stay filled with the Spirit of God. One thing I know about this world is <laughs> you just leak out all of the good stuff because you're, you're in a current that is ungodly, unholy, and so you have to be intentional to make sure that you're in the Spirit of God. And, and more than that, you need supernatural help to live out a Jesus lifestyle for your life. You can't do it on your own. There's too, there's too much working against you. You need supernatural, heavenly intervention to live out the way that God wants you to live. And listen to John 3, verse 5 and 6, describes it. Jesus' answer, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Now, Bible scholars believe that this is not talking about water baptism, but this is talking about you naturally being born, that you were in a water sack in your mother's womb, and the water broke, and you were born, and this is being born of water, and it says, but you can't be a part of the kingdom of God unless you've been born twice. That's why in Christian circles, we use the, the, uh, the language of being born again. First time you were born of water, you're, you're reborn or you're born again when you're born of the Spirit. So when the Spirit of God is activated in you, that you're born again, what happens is it says flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So now something has been given to you that unlocks a supernatural power for you to live the life that God always wanted you to live. All the power that you need to live the godly life that God has purposed you to live, has been given to you through the Holy Spirit living in you. That's being born of the Spirit. Now, Jesus said it this way, and I, I just love metaphors, but he said in John 7, he's, he's at a festival, and he just throws down this really powerful moment in his ministry, and there was some major spiritual significance in this moment. But it says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from him, will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So I'm a word picture guy. And so years ago, I I just had this understanding that basically every day when I wake up, I have a decision to make. What river am I going to swim in that day? And there's only two choices. You can swim in the river of our culture, the river of this world, and that's the default setting. If you don't choose to swim in any river, that's the river that you're going to end up in because you're going to be thrown in one of the rivers. And so the other choice, now that the Spirit of God is in you, if you're a follower of Jesus, that you get to choose to jump into the river of the Spirit. Now, the river of this world and the river of this culture has got a current. It's taking you somewhere, but so does the river of God's Spirit. The river of God's Spirit has a current, and it's also taking you somewhere. So you make a choice daily what river you're going to swim in. And so when you choose to swim in the river of God's Spirit, that is when the supernatural starts taking place out of your life. That's that's the place where you can start seeing God move tangibly, and you're walking in God's words. I heard so many beautiful God stories, how God is 
actively moving in atmosphere people. It's just amazing to me because I've been living this kind of way for 30 years, and it's so awesome to hear somebody that just starts experiencing it for the first time. There is a river that God wants you in in a spirit that is going to take you places you never dreamed you could ever go because it is not just any kind of river. It is the river of the spirit of God alive in you. That's what I'm talking about. As a 14-year-old, I went to Hume Lake Christian Camps and gave my life to Jesus. And one of the first songs I learned at Hume Lake was this song. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. All right, there are my people, the Splish Splashers. Within my soul, spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. It's a sticky song, and you can thank me later that it's going to be in your head for the rest of the day. But I remember as a 14-year-old going, wow, there's this river of life that God has given me access to that makes the, the, the lame to walk and the blind to see. And you guys, 30 years later, or 40 years later, I should say, 40 years later, you guys, it's happening. And it's all because I make a choice that I'm going to swim in the river of the Spirit of God, and then the results follow that decision. So that's how you, you become a part of the campaign of sabotage. Be filled with the Spirit. Number three, I'll go through the rest really quickly. Bring healing to the hurting. So when you, when you intentionally say, I, there's somebody hurting, and I'm going to bring healing to them, and that could look like you praying for the sick. And we don't know when we pray for the sick whether they're going to be healed or not, but by faith, we need to enter into every time that we pray for somebody we know that it's God's will for them not to be sick, but we're going to pray intentionally for God to allow them to recover, to be healed. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but we're going to keep praying and believing and, and, and contending for that person's healing. That, that's what it means to bring healing to the hurting. But hurting is not just physical. Hurting is emotional. Hurting is spiritual. And it's walking along somebody and saying, you know what? You're not going to be by yourself. You're hurting right now, and, I, and I'm going to be a person that walks with you. And you being with a person that's hurting is healing in itself. But it's you intentionally said, I'm not just living for my life. I'm living for other people's lives. And everywhere I go, I want to I make a heavenly deposit of healing in a person that's hurting, maybe it's a coworker that's crying and you got a pile of paperwork to do and you're like, man, I'm not even gonna get out at five o'clock, but man, Lord, my coworker's crying. And you're just saying, you know what? I trust you, God. This work is gonna be done. I have a mission right now to bring healing to that hurting coworker in Jesus' name. And it could be just like, hey, I see you. I care about you. Can you, you wanna tell me what's going on? And you just pray for them because they're hurting in that moment. But when you bring healing to the hurting, what you're doing is you are a part of God's revolutionary work and his sabotage campaign to stomp out the kingdom of darkness by bringing the kingdom of God in that moment. So that's the bringing healing to the hurting. Number four, bringing freedom to the captives. I will tell you, there's some people, I mean, they're stuck in their stuff. Uh, around here, we call it strongholds, uh, but it's oppression. And there's some, some people that come in every week and they're wearing all the oppression on them. And sometimes it's our prayer team afterwards just going, hey, we just feel like you're, you're just weighed down with some stuff. We're going to contend and pray for you that you walk out of here set free from all of the chains that have maybe been on you for generations. There's something your grandparents or your parents may have been involved in and may have like, uh, you know, brought you into like not intentionally, but just unintentionally, but it's in your life because of generations before you and the kingdom of God can set you free from generational chains of addictions, generational chains of abuse. God can set you free. And when you as a kingdom-minded person walk into a room and you sense that there's a strong on you, you start praying for a deliverance, the kingdom of God is showing up and you become part of God's great sabotage campaign. When you bring this, man, I'm preaching, and this is the third time I'm doing this, so. Where's my hanky? Where's my hanky? But you, you guys, can you feel my passion? I, I just, 
I've walked too many family members and friends through addiction issues, and sometimes bringing freedom to the captives is simply walking somebody through their recovery and just being by them saying, you know what, I'm going to be your heavenly sponsor. I'm going to walk you through, and I'm going to see you go all through all the steps until your steps lead to Jesus as not just your higher power, but to lead you to Jesus who is your king. That's what it is to be walking with somebody into their recovery. And then check this out, bringing good news to the poor. You want to be part of God's great campaign of sabotage? Bring good news to the poor. What does that look like practically? Poor in spirit, poor in wealth. But Jesus, is, he seemed to be really attracted to those that were poor, and, and he gave his all to them. And I want to just declare to you guys that there are people hurting financially. There are people hurting physically that God may have given you some extra resources so that you can be blessed to become a blessing to somebody that is in need. And can you imagine when you show up and you're generous to somebody that's poor, how grateful they are, where you can say, hey, God is the one that blessed me so that I can become a blessing for you. I started this tradition years ago, but I carry a $100 bill with me in, in my pocket. And I never know when God is going to prompt me to, like, help somebody that's in need. And, and if we're really sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you're going you're gonna to be moved to help somebody that is poor. And when you show outrageous generosity, you're bringing good news to the poor. I don't know if every poor person I've met was already a follower of Jesus. But every time I've helped somebody in crisis and maybe blessed them with generosity... Of where there is hatred. So when, when you have a heart posture of resentment and maybe even bitterness to where you're just like, I can't stand their face. And let's just be real. That, like, is there somebody in your life right now when, when you think of them, you're just like, I, I honestly, I don't like them. And I, maybe I, I can even say I have hatred towards them. Like, as I think about them, I just, I just want to punch them in the throat. Is anybody, like, resonating with that? They, we, hopefully they're not sitting next to you right now, okay? But we all have somebody like that where you're just like, mm, I just struggle. I just struggle with them. And when we love, even when our body and everything inside of us is wanting to hate, we are putting on display the kingdom of God. Because you know what the most vital part of the kingdom of God is, the, the most um, thick, concentrated part of the kingdom of God, it's love. Even John said in one of his letters, he said, if you hate your brother, but you say you, you love God, he says, you're a liar because you can't do both. Because when the kingdom of God has been activated in you, it doesn't say you won't struggle, but the hatred has to leave because love has taken its place. And every time you walk in love instead of walk in hatred, you are putting on display the kingdom of heaven. And so that's how you become a sabotager. You say, I'm not going to hate them. Everything that they did and the world says, I, I should just cancel them. I should unfriend them. I should do away with them. Everything inside of you is saying that, but there's, there's this heaven calling you as a citizen of heaven saying, love them. Why? Because the cross told us that while we were enemies to God, Christ died for us. Jesus, hanging on the cross, he says these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's one thing to forgive a person that is admitting that they hurt you, they wounded you, they offended you, and they're so sorry that they did that. It's easier to forgive them in that position. But could you forgive somebody just as easy that hasn't been apologetic for what they did? It's harder. Years ago, there was a guy that was saying some mean things about my father-in-law, and I worked for my father-in-law for years, and it was making me mad. It was making my wife mad. And one day he walked into the, the Starbucks where we were had a, having a Bible study, and fortunately, praise God, I was swimming in the right river that day. Because <laughs> if you see somebody that you've had all these feelings for, it's like, hmm. But in that moment, the love of God just, like, took over. And I actually bought him coffee. And it was, a, it was something more for me than that guy. And I, and I just, 
I sat down and I, we had some theological differences and I just sat down and I just didn't get into all the theological arguments. I just said, Hey man, I, I know, you know, you're, you're a man of God and it's great to see you. And we just had this beautiful godly conversation and I didn't touch it. I didn't feel it was in the, the, the moment, but that meeting was more for me than him. Because in that moment, I got to show myself that it is possible to have hatred inside of you, but for the kingdom of God to win at the end of the day, that love always conquers hate. And when I allow love to conquer hate in my own life, I'm putting God's kingdom on display for the rest of the world. And this world wants to demonize people to you, to where you, you get on Facebook and you're like, I'm going to say all of this stuff. It's, it's very unkingdom like. I don't care how disagreement or how much of a disagreement you have with them. It's very unkingdom like to spew hate, especially on social media. I don't agree with them. Well, it doesn't mean you have to hate them. You can say your disagreement, but you could do it in love. Number seven is bring gratitude where there's grumbling, and we're way over time. I hate it. They have a clock that counts backwards, and it's red by 10 minutes. It's like, you need to stop 10 minutes ago. Uh, I'm, can I just give you this one last thing? Okay. Uh, Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will, what church? You will shine among them like what? Stars in the sky. When you are living as a kingdom of God person, as a citizen where Jesus is ruling and reigning in your life, you're going to do a lot less grumbling and you're going to be a lot less more grateful. I was standing in line at a grocery store not too long ago and the checker was slow. And you ever been in a slow line and you're watching the other line you could have chosen and that's going so much faster and you're in a hurry. And you're just like, what is going on? And then somebody next to me is like, I can't believe how slow this is going. And I just had a moment. I was just like, yeah, but you know what? We get to live in one of the most beautiful places on the planet. You could be living in Bakersfield. <laughs> Sorry if you are from Bakersfield. I love you guys. You're my family. But you could be living somewhere you think about where you live be grateful we get to live in the promised land yes we're we're getting a little slowed down but maybe we need to slow down maybe god has a word for us that we're moving too fast it's perspective isn't it when you are grateful instead of grumpy you are shining like a star in the midst of a dark kingdom that is complaining and grumbly all the time i'm out of time 10 minutes ago. But I hope you guys receive something, the kingdom of God. I love you guys. Don't tell the other two gatherings, you're my favorite gathering, all right? But Father, we, we just honor you as our king. We want to make you king size, take you out of our pockets, and put you on the throne of our lives. And if you're here today, you've never made Jesus king of your life. There's no better way to live your life. And the Bible says when you do that, you become part of the kingdom of God, the unshakable kingdom, that when everything else is shaking, you don't have to be. That's the kingdom of God. And there's an invitation in front of you to become part of this kingdom, to making Jesus king of your life. And if that's you and you want to join the sabotage campaign, then you pray this prayer right where you're sitting after me. Jesus, today I make you king of my life. Thank you for the cross that you died for me while I was still your enemy. Fill me with your spirit. I jump into the river of your goodness today and help me. Be a kingdom person, living out the kingdom of God now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, 
we have a, 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 just a, a thing that we ask of you, and that's to let us know that you, you pray that prayer because we want to partner with you in this decision. We don't want you to be alone. We want to help you, give you some resources. But text the word FOLLOW to 805-334-8700, okay? And then um, somebody will be in touch with you. And then let somebody else know that you made that decision, all right? We love to end our time in worship. So let's stand together if we're able to, and let's end with some singing. Thank you for tuning in today to another great episode from Atmosphere Church. If this message has spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe buttons. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this episode and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not just these things, but to also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.